Hi, welcome back to Two Guys in a Game Shop. My name is Phil. I'm John. And today we're going to talk about diplomacy. It's a classical game of intrigue, trust, and treachery. So we'll be first discussing a history of the game and then following with the play after that and then wrap up with our thoughts afterward. So now we're going to tell you a little bit about the history of Diplomacy. Um, this game actually has a really rich history to it because it wasn't first released until 1959. Um, interesting thing about it was it was turned down by all the major publisher game publishers in the beginning. Um, and the way to get the game off the ground, the original designer, Alan uh, Calhamer, had financed the game through... Uh, his own money to make the first 500 copies, and the game kind of took off from there. Yeah, it was a game that really didn't fit with the with the style of games at the time. The publishers then didn't make games like this, and so it, it took a little bit of time before some companies actually picked up on what this game offered and were able to publish it in a little bit more... Um, mass market uh, release. Uh, the, the big one, the, the biggest push was from Avalon Hill when they picked it up in 1976. Then later on when Avalon Hill had been purchased by Hasbro um, and later on they purchased Wizards of the Coast, they later re-released it in 2008 under the Wizard and Coast um, logo. And that's what this one is. This is the 50th anniversary. It was published in 2008 um, basically 50 years from the original 1959 release and uh, and this was put out by Wizards of the Coast under the Avalon Hill title um, and it's basically the same game that has existed for all those years I and mean, we're still playing in 2016 what came out in 1959 it's that tried and true of a system for this game. Yeah, it's interesting also when you think of some of the people who really enjoyed this game throughout history. Um, John F. Kennedy was one. Henry Kissinger yeah, was one of his favorite games. And uh, Walter Cronkite was also said to really enjoy this game. Um, so a lot of famous people, as well as um, Larry Harris, who designed Axis and Allies, um, Conquest of the Empire, um, and broadsides and boarding parties, just tons of like uh, really pivotal games later on, um, adored this game. In fact, he's credited with saying that this game should be required play in high school um, due to different facets of the game. Yeah. Um, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it definitely opens people's eyes to um, the the real personality of of uh, people, how they can tell the truth or possibly tell lies, and, and it's up to you as the individual to be able to uh, discern or um, just use your gut feeling to... To know if they're telling you the truth or yeah. they're not. Yeah. yeah, it's a very good game in that regard. So here you see an overview of the pieces that come in the Diplomacy game. You've got a rather nice looking game board and you have a packet of reference sheets which basically show the exact same thing as the game board so that when you are discussing it with other people you can take one of these along rather than hovering over the game board and showing everybody your moves. You also of course have the rules of the game and then you have the game pieces. There is army, navy, and control markers. And ones for each different country out there. You'll have, um, of course, Russia, um, the Ottoman Empire, Austria, Germany, Italy, France, and England. Um, looking at this also, you basically have all the big contenders during the start of World War One, which is where the game kind of goes before World War One starts. So here you see the game board as it's completely set up. All the pieces that are in play at the start of the game begin in these locations. You have basically armies and navies. 
So each turn, you have both a spring turn and a fall turn in a year. In the spring turn, you have four phases that you go through. First phase is a diplomatic phase, and that's when you get engaged with the other players, each one controlling a country, and you say, hey, I want to talk to you. I want to try and negotiate what I want to try and get, and you can negotiate what you want to try and get, or you can go and threaten other countries and, and say, hey, I'm, I'm taking that, and you're not taking that. A um, lot of different things that can go on in the diplomatic phase. After the diplomatic phase, you have the order writing phase. And the order breakdown is fairly simple in this game. You have hold, where you just stay exactly where you're at and hold your position. Um, you next have your move. You're allowed to move one space, um, and this works for both infantry and for, or, sorry, army. It's even simpler than that. Army and navy, um, where you can move one space. Um, your next is support. Um, you can support on offense and support on defense. So say I wanted to support with this unit, um, this unit here, I could write a support order for the defense of this place. Um, I could also support on attack. So if I was going to attack into here, so I move into here, I can use this unit to support that attack into here if I was right here. There is also convoy. So convoy comes into play where if I have um, a navy out here, I can convoy into a new place by using my navy across there. And that is all the moves there is. The so, orders. So these orders are written down on a piece of paper, and the next phase is the order resolution phase, in which case you hand your written orders to the player to your left and they resolve your orders as you wrote them for your units. So if you didn't write your orders correctly, your units aren't necessarily moving exactly where you wanted them to. So it's really important that you write, you know, Fleet Edinburgh to North Sea. You know, it's very simple rules, but it's amazing sometimes what can be kind of misconstrued, miswritten, or purposefully not written uh, in this game. After you resolve the order resolution, you then have the retreat and disbanding phase. And what that is is basically during the order resolution you have battles and battles are done on a very simple mathematic basis greater number wins so as an example here if you had two Russian armies here and a German army there and the Russian army the Russian leader had orders to move, as John mentioned. You would have two versus one, so the two would beat the one, and the one during this retreat phase would have to retreat back. The other one would move in, and that's simple combat resolution. If this one wasn't there and you only had one versus one, there is no change whatsoever. You always have to have superior numbers in combat resolution. After you do the spring phase, you then do the fall phase, which also has a diplomatic phase, an order writing phase, an order resolution phase, a retreat and disbanding phase, but it also has a fifth phase, which allows you to gain or lose units depending on your control. So, looking at what, how many stars you have, 
um, and that you control, you're allowed to, if I have three, I can have three units. Now let's say I was able to take over here Belgium, I would now have four, I would gain one unit now, and I can put those out of one of my stars. Um, let's say I had lost territory, and now I'm down to two stars, and I'd had this out in the North Sea, I'm now going to have to lose a unit. And so I would lose a unit also, since I only have two stars. Pretty simple deciding who stays alive and who dies. And that is the entirety of the rules for this game. Extremely simple rules as far as explaining them and resolving them. So there's the overview and the rules of a very simple game of diplomacy. Uh, the game plays between two and seven players per the box. I would highly suggest not playing two players. I've done it before. It's not that good. This sounds completely terrible. Because <laughs> it, it basically it lacks what this game focuses on, which is diplomacy. I mean, it's it's key. So you need more people, and and this game really emphasizes that interaction between the players. That being able to with as straight a face as you can, lie blatantly to the person to, for your betterment. Uh, it's it, or tell the honest truth and not have the other person believe you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for whatever reason. That's one of the great things about this game is uh, you are the diplomat for your country. Your country comes first, and there is no second. <laughs> right. Your goal is to take over all of Europe and help your country do that. Yeah, and it's not like all the other countries are going to go, oh, yeah, sure, go ahead, take us over. Yeah, not going to do that. <laughs> um, the interactions is truly what makes this game great. Um, getting about that actually brings up one point with this game I find uh, really strange, and that is this game actually has a bad rep for that. Um, before I played the game, um, I had even heard from people, it's like, oh, you lose friends playing diplomacy. Um, which I'm like, wow. After playing, I'm like, if you're that thin-skinned to lose a friend over it, well, maybe it wasn't that good of a friend. Um, the interactions and stuff, if you can play with good people who understand this is a game, one of the games the game involves is lying, and get over that fact that someone may have lied to you um, to better their country. I mean, diplomats do that literally all the time. Oh, yeah. I mean, and the the whole aspect of, you know, losing friends, I think, is is total rubbish. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's one of those things where I have never ever lost a friend playing this game. And I played this game back before there was the internet. Uh so I didn't hear any of these negative reviews or anything else like that. I played this game a long time ago and enjoyed it so much the way that you interact with the other players and I've had great fun with it. I actually ran this game at at the Montana Game Fair that we had here. It's a local game fair. And when I ran it, I had seven players, two of which had played the game before. Other five had never played the game in their life. So I had to explain the rules, which are very simple. And when it was all done... Uh, we, we, we played, I think it was about a three hour game that we played, and everybody had fun playing it, and they had so much fun playing it that those people went and voted and actually won for me this, this medal right here, which is best game of the fair. Uh, so I don't feel that a game where you could supposedly lose friends over it could ever win best game of the fair for people enjoying it. I mean, it's it just it boggles my mind that people can think that you can lose friends over a game like this. Yeah, I thought it was absolutely rush. I've only played the game once, and you know what? I would love to play it again. Um, I played Phil. We had... We, get, did we had a full, full seven, seven. Yep. playing, um, and it will go down that game as one of the funnest games I've ever played in my life. Um, I mean that from the bottom of my heart, actually. I was able to manipulate people, um, 
And at the same time, I was manipulated also sometimes because <laughs> Phil did manipulate me a few times to do things that I was like, ah, ah, that was in his best interest and not mine. But it was great. Um, the reading of people, understanding what's going on, and having that gut feeling, be like, is this guy lying to me? Is this guy not lying to me? Um, and actually, a good friend of mine, um, I completely both us lied to and totally slaughtered him in one turn. <laughs> we are still friends. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't count how many times I've... I've uh, told a little white lie and not supported somebody in an attack, and they ended up getting just completely snookered and and some of their area taken over. And I still have good friendships with those people. They still play the game with me. I mean, it's it's one of those games where as long as you go into it explaining to people, people are going to tell the truth. People are going to lie. That is the point of this. This game is about diplomacy. You have to learn how to read people. You have to learn to discern, is this person telling the truth? Is that in their best interest? Or is this person telling me a lie? And am I going to feel the wrath of somebody else coming in my back door? Yep, exactly. I think also a kind of interesting misnomer of this game is I do not consider this to be a war game. Um, it has war pieces in it. I mean, it has armies and it has navy. Um, but the simplicity of how the game moves, it's all about the subtle interactions between players and not so subtle sometimes um, because you can also pos bargain for a position of strength in this game. But it all hedges. There's no random chance in this game. Everything is about you and how good you can sell your... Um, your betterment of your nation to other people. Yeah, since it's straight numbers, higher numbers beat lower numbers. I mean, you you can't ever do it by yourself. This is not a game yeah. where you can exist in a bubble. No. Um, you, you can't go out and take over all that stuff by yourself because if you don't have support from those other nations, if you don't do a little give and take, you're just going to get left behind. Oh, yeah. You know, if you're not if you're not engaging with other players in this game, it's your own fault. Right. Because everybody, I we even played the game. There was an Italian player who lied the entire game to me. I mean, every <laughs> every aspect that he said ended up being a lie, and I don't know why I keep kept listening to him, but he lied the entire game to me. Yet he was so small. I mean, I, he, he was down to just one army, mm -hmm. yet he was still lying to me yeah. <laughs> with that one army. He was like, yeah, I'll support you. And then he supported another army, I think it was the Germans, to, to come and attack me. Yeah. But I had learned, and so I had supported and, and defended against that particular, particular threat. Threat, yeah. Yeah. So... Even with the lying, this thing is there's a good time to lie and a bad time to lie in the game. If you lie all the time, no one will trust you. Yes. Yes, exactly. Liars all the time, nobody trusts you, and you'll end up getting picked apart. Yeah. Tell the truth all the time, nobody will trust you. <laughs> no one will trust you, even if you do tell the truth all the time. They're like, what's in it for him? Yeah. Or if you're telling the truth, yeah, I want to take this area because that's going to give me the strength to end up taking you out eventually. It's like, well, that's not what everybody wants to hear. <laughs> yeah, because the game will continue until either one person controls everything or everybody agrees to just, we're done playing. Yeah. <laughs> it can take a while. Uh, when we played, we, uh, we ended up, um, so France and me ended up splitting the world, basically. But I had more of the world, so I was kind of cool. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a very good game. Not not necessarily emphasis on war. It's more emphasis, as per the name, diplomacy. It's very player interactive in this game. I mean, it's all about your diplomatic ability um, to to wrangle other players to your best interest. Uh, the the game itself very simple. This one has a beautiful game board. But, oh, the pieces. Um, you know, for a 50th anniversary edition, you would hope that they would give you nicer pieces than little cardboard pieces. Uh, of all the games I've played, most of them were some of the original Avalon Hill games. They had little wood blocks 
uh, little wood squares for the armies and long wood blocks for the navies. Uh, the in in the I think it was late 90s they released a game an a, a diplomacy game from Avalon Hill that had metal pieces metal armies and metal navies uh, which were really kind of interesting and mm-hmm. when we played we actually played with this map because this is probably one of the best maps that I've seen for this game but with those metal pieces because these cardboard pieces are admittedly kind of a letdown. Um, Wish they would have done a little bit better. Yeah, could have kicked it up a notch. Now, on the flip side, they did keep the price point pretty low, but even at 35 bucks uh, retail for the game, uh, well, I think you can do a little better than cardboard chits on the 50th anniversary. I mean, fortunately, the the pieces aren't the focal point of the game. Right. So it's, it's not like it's going to be a game killer uh, just by having cardboard pieces because the focus of the game is diplomacy. And uh, and that's that's player interaction. Yep. So if you enjoy having player interaction with other people and whatnot, I say this is a great game to pick up. Um, if you're thin skinned, maybe not so much. But um, honestly, maybe you could surprise yourself. So yeah. So give it a try. As you can see, it's a very simple game. It's a very long lasting game. It's been around since 1959, so there's a lot of people who really enjoy this game. It's not a friendship killer, and, and it's very good at keeping people involved in the game. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it, and catch our next episode later on.